what do you think? How do, how do you see this playing out? Well, I think it's important that all of a sudden, uh, as a Nigerian looking at South Africa from outside of South Africa, the question of corruption, uh, it, it was never such a big issue and, uh, in South Africa. Now it's become the issue. So economic performance, corruption. Is there a link between high corruption and poor economic performance? And there's similarities, some similarities between Nigeria and South Africa there. And here is a Nigerian president who's one of the cardinal pillars of his programs is fighting corruption. Here is Cyril Ramaphosa being brought in, one, to attack corruption, but more importantly, to create an economic environment which is investor conducive. Uh, so looking at the two largest economies in Africa, which constitute over 65 percent or 60 percent of the GDP of the continent, these two countries are laggards in terms of growth. The average growth between Nigeria and South Africa compared to the other economies uh, is about 1.2 percent when you take the average of Nigeria and South Africa compared to 6.3 percent which is the rest of the next 10 countries. Uh, it tells you a story. Uh, if, the, uh, if the political situation can be resolved and corruption tackled effectively and investor confidence restored, these two economies have the potential of getting up to the sub-Saharan African average of 3.5% and actually uh, being the catalyst of total African growth. All right, then let me bring Rod into the conversation here. Rod, I understand you're, you're, you're carrying out some observation duties on these elections. Can you speak to, give us some updates on what you've seen so far on the ground? Well, it's still a little bit too early for us to, to pronounce, but things seem to be going smoothly as far as we can tell. So it seems to be peaceful at this point. Yeah, so but let's look at um, the build up to the elections, though, um, and what you expect um, so far on the conversations that have been, you know, taking the front burner on, on, on these elections. Yeah. I, think, I think Bismarck hit it on the head that corruption has been a big issue, and we've had the leadership transition from President Zuma to President Ramaphosa, which preceded the election, came earlier this year. Um, and the big issues in the news have been uh, public uh, commissions of inquiry into state capture, which is kind of grand corruption, um, and also just really this issue of renewal in, in the ANC. It's really the first time since 1994 that the ANC is coming from the back foot and now trying to, to uh, expand its support after a, a, a big dip over the last five years or so. All right, then, looking at that now, let's look at um, what we can say regarding, you know, voter education in the build-up of this. I understand there's quite a number of young population who will be voting for the first time. Yeah, uh, one of the big problems in South Africa has been the, that uh, youth, I think it's, it's true throughout the world, that youth voter registration tends to be quite low. And I think that that trend has actually gotten worse for this election. I don't have the exact figures, but... If you look at the, the age bracket, like 18 to 25, um, you'll find some of the lowest registration rates of the entire electorate. So that doesn't really bode well for the, you know, the, the, the young graduates who are unemployed and looking for work and yet are not uh, taking part in the political process at, at the same rates as other parts of society. All right, Bismarck, I'd like to bring you in on this. Um, what do you think about, you know, when you look at the, the history of South Africa and how they got to where they are, and then you have this, you know, this young population who, um, for some of them, uh, you know, getting to participate for the election the first time? Um, I think unemployment, and youth unemployment in particular, is a fallout of bad economic management and low investment. And when you look at the low investment. There's investment in the maintenance of the infrastructure and upgrading the infrastructure, and there's new investment to make the country competitive. In both, if you look at both variables, South Africa is falling behind. There's been poor investment in maintaining the infrastructure which they had in the past from the apartheid period. There's been much lower investment in improving the productivity of the country. So total factor product productivity in South Africa has actually been negative. 
So it means, that, and once total factor productivity is negative, it means it's a projection of what future, what the future looks like. It means that there will be unemployment, there will be inflation, there will be lack of opportunity. In other words, the misery index will be very high. And what is more disturbing in the case of South Africa, and to some extent Nigeria, is the level of income inequality. South Africa has a Gini coefficient far in excess of 53, uh, which means that the, the country is very unequal. Uh, income is trapped at the top percentile, maybe 5 10% of the country have access to. And where you have high Gini coefficient and high income inequality, it's always followed by a violent crime. So you have low investment, high income inequality, violent crime, and de de uh, deteriorating infrastructure. This is a recipe for what we can call a state that could be failing. It has to be arrested. The, 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 the good news is that South Africa has the built-in infrastructure. South Africa has the manpower, the skilled manpower. What they need to do is to actually just ensure that they make investors more confident and more at ease. And then when that investment comes in, uh, you need. Unfortunately, the last couple of years under Zuma were very trying years and very interesting developments. But at the same time, the country fell uh, sharply in every, every indicator you can measure. All right, then. let me bring in Rod to comment on this. Rod, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the inequality in South Africa. Yeah, I, I think President Ramaphosa, he's got a difficult, uh, both of the issues that, uh, the main issues that Bismarck has raised are reflected in the political system because the ANC right now, the two main opposition parties are the Democratic Alliance, which is from the liberal tradition in South African politics and tends to be more pro-business, pro-investment, and then the um, economic freedom fighters who are a kind of militant populist breakaway from actually the ANC Youth League originally. Um, and so he's trying to actually balance both of these things. One, on one side, trying to bring in a lot of investment through market-friendly approaches to uh, public services, infrastructure, and so on. Um, and at the same time, he's under a lot of pressure to address demands for land reform coming from the, coming from the left. And so it's a very difficult balancing act. And I think, um, you know, he, he's, he, for, for the first few months that he's, been, uh, uh, that he's been in office, he doesn't have that electoral mandate to kind of push forward really strongly on these two issues. And I think a lot of the debate around the election has really been about, you know, what kind of, what kind of president will Ramaphosa be when he has his own mandate and he's a lot uh, freer to pursue the kind of policies that he's been talking about. All right, then we'll, keep, uh, con we'll continue the conversations around the mandate for uh, the, um, the President Cyril Mafoposa after the break. I've been speaking to Bismarck Rewane, the CEO of Financial Derivatives, and Rod Allen, an associate professor um, at the University of Wits. Um, you're watching Power Lunch West Africa. We'll take a quick break and we'll continue after the conversation. I have Bismarck Rewane, the CEO of Financial Derivatives, and joining us from Johannesburg is Rod Allen, an associate professor at, and head of international um, relations at the University of Wits in South Africa. So let's come back to our conversation earlier. Um, Rod, let me start with you. We, we were talking earlier about um, Cyril Ramaphosa's mandate, but I'd, I'd like you to speak also on the, the inefficiencies of the AFC over this period and how the other parties are trying to latch into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, during the, during the Zuma years, especially the later Zuma years, we saw a decline in ANC support nationally and um, to an extent that the ANC hasn't had to cope with since 1994. Um, so there's um, the municipal elections that were held uh, in 2016, uh, the ANC's support level had fell into the below 60 percent. Uh, and I think it's going to be a real litmus test for the ANC whether they can get back to that 60 percent mark in, in this election. Um, and if they do so, you know, that's going to put pressure on the main opposition parties as well because there's only so many votes to go, to go around. And if the ANC is able to bounce back somewhat, it's going to mean that some of the opposition parties could take a big hit. 
All right, then, but this back, let me bring you to the conversation. We're looking at the um, issues that have also been, you know, other issues taken around the front burner. We've seen the um, parties latching on to land reforms to try and bring some promises to, to the voters. And we've seen also uh, inefficiencies in the power in the industry. You know, for a country that is looking to position itself as, one, as, the, as the, one of the top economies in Africa, how should they be, you know, positioned in regards to these areas? Uh, I think uh, what, what you raise is uh, partly business and economics, but mostly ideological. You must not forget that the ANC was a liberation movement turned political party whose mandate initially was to liberate and protect the um, discriminated against black community in South Africa. Now, now we are in the 21st century. Now it's about management, it's about governance, it's about transparency, it's about having policies at work, it's about being competitive. Those uh, new uh, issues as far as the ANC is concerned. They don't have that kind of tradition, they don't have that history. So this is the first time that they're being managed and luckily you have some of the Ramaphosa who has come from the business, first of all as a union leader, then a, a business leader. Now, so he has the correct mix to address the policy framework which will, one, deal with the fears of alienation and fears of the, the black empowerment program. But at the same time, knowing that the black empowerment program is no, of no use if there's no investment. So how do you align, how do you trade off? This, this, is, this is the key issue. The, the paranoia of being victims of oppression has to give way to embracing the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the norms of uh, the wealth of nations, international trade, the African Free Trade Agreement, opening up markets, and to a large extent, privatizing part of the uh, of, uh, of the economy. All right, then let me bring Rod. Now, Rod, you've listened to Bismarck talking about this. You know, do you think the ANC, as it is, is structured, you know, to take on the challenges of facing South Africa going forward? Well, I think the big test is going to really start, you know, next week or, le or this weekend because I think that uh, f for the past year or so, the, the ANC has been so um, busy dealing with its internal conflicts that um, really I think those have taken priority. There's been a lot that's been done. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's been a lot, uh, a, a lot of cleanup already happening at the state-owned enterprises, and so those are looking a lot better. It's looking like there may be more foreign funding coming in. Um, but, I mean, really the plans, the plans for the economy have been on the table for many years. Uh, uh, President Ramaphosa was formerly the head of the, the um, National Planning Commission, and they have a very, very detailed plan. What's been lacking has been the political will to implement it. And um, I think it will be just as soon as this, this election is over, assuming that there's no huge surprise that's unfavorable to the ANC, I think we'll, we'll finally have a government with a political mandate to try to implement uh, the, the, uh, some of these growth-oriented policies because really there's no alternative to economic growth. I mean, you can't, ad address, uh, you can't address youth unemployment when your economy is growing 1% per year um, and, and the workforce is growing at a much faster rate than that. All right, then. Thank you so much for your contributions on the show. I've been speaking to Bismarck Rewane, the CEO of Financial Derivatives, and Rod Allens is an associate professor and head of the International Relations at University of Wits in Johannesburg, South Africa. And that's a wrap on Power Launch West Africa for today. Thank you so much for watching, and bye for now. I'm Kenneth Bomo, and have a wonderful day.